This is a University of Otago podcast. This weekend, Brian Turner is receiving his honorary doctorate of literature from Otago University. Uh, Brian was um, Burns Fellow here in 1984, and I'm Graham Sidney. I was Francis Hodgkins Fellow in 1978 on the art side. But we are going to talk to Brian today um, in recognition of his honorary doctorate and um, the fact that he on Saturday will be delivering the graduation speech um, at um, the Regent Theatre. BT. <laughs> yes, Graham. I want to start with Audrey and Elf and want you to tell me about them, what they were like, as you recall, when you were young, what got them together, and how the Turner family, as we know it now, began. Tell us about Audrey and Alf. Mm. My father was the son of <coughs> Elizabeth, Liz, who was born and brought up in Hamilton Bay, between Port Chalmers and Aramoana, one of a family of 16 or 17. Um, his father was Louis, who was born, I think, in Birmingham, came out here before the First World War, um, was sent off to the First World War. He was the only child. Um, <clears throat> my mother's father was brought up on a farm in Wyanawa, near Invercargill. Her mother was Annie. Uh, she termed Annie a foundling. And when she married her father, mum said they had difficulty in discovering where she'd come from and you know, getting her certificate and so on. We were what well, was then called working class. My father went to the First World War, uh, Second World War, came home and I was there small, about a year old. Um, he was a bike mechanic. Um, then he became a taxi driver. Then he drove the bread truck for the rest of his working life. My mum got married when she was still in her teens. Um, she was what was then called a housewife for most of her life. They did various part-time jobs. <coughs> um, we lived with first my mother's um, parents, then my father's parents, then we moved to a state house in Christophen. Then we moved down to the North End, just not far from the studio here, and we lived in a two-storied wooden house in what was then Harbour Terrace, opposite the now art school. Um, I called it a menagerie. We had um, two cousins who lived with us. We had a boarder, as it called in those days, um, <clears throat> an aunt for a while. It was mum, dad, me and Glenn, um, my other brother not born in those days. And um, we spent a number of years there. I loved it there. It was. <clears throat> Um, there was lots of contention, lots of argument, um, lots of discussion, lots of energy. Um, it was a vigorous and stimulating childhood, no ostentation, no pretension, um, perfect. I want to come back to that, that family situation um, a little bit later. But a couple of things come out immediately your whole family origin is firmly rooted in the south of the South Island. That's true. Through, through the mum and dad. Yes. And most interestingly, when you were born, dad wasn't there. That's true. Um, my first 
memory of him, and I must have been about a year old, was a man coming in the back door in his army uniform and taking me out of my mother's arms and holding me up in the air. And <clears throat> I realised a year or so later that um, <clears throat> I had up before then, uh, I had had my father pointed out to me there was a picture of him in his army uniform on my, his parents' his house uh, wall and on the wall of my mother's parents. And, uh, yeah, so he was a stranger, I suppose, but uh, one soon grew accustomed to Alf. He had a strong personality. Hmm. I want to talk about that a wee bit soon, too. Hmm. Um, another important feature was that this, as you say, was a working class family. How did you, how do you remember it? Did, did you feel that you were in any way deprived or that the family was um, in difficulties? Well, you were the first born. Hmm. Glenn came a couple of years. Three years and a bit later. Yeah. Hmm. Those early childhood memories in, in this what always seems to me from your recollections to be a, a, a sort of extended family. There were always aunts and uncles and boarders mm. and what have you all mm. around, mm. mainly male, I might say. Mm. It was an almost entirely mm -hmm. male environment apart from your mum. Mm. What, you, what, what did it feel like? Was it, a, was it a, a straightened circumstance? Was it difficult or did it not linger like that for <coughs> no, you? No, I never felt straightened. One was acutely aware in those days that there wasn't much to come and go on. Um, my father's father was a very keen gardener. He had a garden big enough to feed almost the street, really. <coughs> but most people did have gardens in those days. Um, mm. we had, there was a clear distinction between a need and a want. We were a waste-not, want-not family. Thank God for small mercy sort of stuff. Um, um, but we always had we always had enough of everything, and I never at any time felt deprived. Um, <clears throat> there was a great deal of debate in the house always. My father was what sometimes deemed opinionated. He had a view on most things. Um, my cousins, when uh, we lived with them, uh, they had a view, view on a lot of things. Um, you were encouraged to uh, argue, to challenge. Um, if you didn't have a decent case, then you needed to keep your mouth shut because you would be cut down. Is this uh, from a very yeah. young age? Or yeah, is this very, very, yeah. Mm. Um, my father's mother was had a very, what they call a very sharp tongue. Um, she'd tell you outright, she never beat around the bush. Mm. <coughs> um, <coughs> You know, occasionally you'd be told you'll get a clip over the ear if you, you know, do the mm. wrong thing, as mm. it were. Um, was it a house filled with books and music? No. Lots of, quite a lot of music, though. Um, I mean, we're, as time went by, there was more and more music in the house. Because my father became very fond of classical music when I was about eight or nine, I suppose. He bought records from the World Record Club. And when we were living over there in, um, in North Dunedin here, opposite the art school, um, which was then the Dunedin North Intermediate School, mm. actually, um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> we, by that stage I, I was starting to read quite a lot, so I became known as a bookworm as well. But <coughs> Dad would play music loudly all the time <coughs> in the house. Mm. And... Um, <coughs> My grandmother read the truth. That was her Bible, New Zealand truth. Um, mm. She said that New Zealand was... There were too many um, bastards in New Zealand at that time, she thought, and she discovered that through, um, through the truth. She liked nothing better than to relate to us the most salacious event of the week as far as truth was concerned. Would we'll read it out loud? Yes, mm. yes, of course. Mm. And... You went on holidays, didn't you? Mm -hmm. um, 
tell tell us more about that now, because that's a, I think that's a significant lead. <clears throat> well, every weekend was a holiday. Whoever that Englishman was, and I won't say his name, who came to New Zealand and said it was closed on the weekend, might have been Freud, Clement Freud, I'm not sure. Uh, I didn't find it like that. I loved the fact that there was a five-day working week, um, that things opened up, opportunities opened up on the weekends. So if you wanted to play sport, the club you played for knew you were available to play. Um, so, um, <coughs> so there was some sort of semblance of security in that. And on Sundays we often went on picnics. We would go fishing trips and so on and so on. Um, we also went to cycling a lot. My father was a very keen cyclist. And my cousin was very, very good, Alan Larkins. Went to the Melbourne Olympics, 1956. And, and they were all my heroes, the cyclists. Cyclists, some rugby players and cricketers. They were my heroes when I was young. Was that yeah. through Elf? Yeah, Elf, Elf was you know, a great sports enthusiast, um, well informed. He became in time first-class cricket umpire. He umpired for about 25, 27 years. I think he umpired the first game Plunkett Shield match that was ever held at uh, Alexandra. Um, so, <clears throat> and Alf used to periodically break into Italian because he spent quite a lot of time in Italy during the war. And, um, <clears throat> and he liked nothing better than to pronounce the... Um, names of Italian cyclists, Fausto Coppi, Gino Batali, and so on. And Larkins, um, your cousin, uh, a New Zealand champion, lived with you, didn't he? Yeah, and so did his brother, Jim. Mm. Um, Jim played cricket in the Mercantile League at the Oval on the weekends. He was a plumber or electrician, one or the other. Might have been both, knowing Jim. <laughs> um, and Alan, Alan put himself through correspondence, become... Um, he was doing a course in structural engineering, I know that, <coughs> and drafting and so on. Alan used to train and train and train. <coughs> I mean, we learned in those days that there was no shortcut to anything. Um, he, um, the cyclists impressed me, one, because they went off to places you, you didn't know where they went to, but they went off for hours and then they came back as they would say, shattered, covered in mud and all sorts of stuff, or wet and cold or whatever. They'd be away for hours. And Alan and the boys would go out most nights of the week and train, and they'd race on Saturdays, and they'd go and sometimes ride to Waitahuna and back on Sunday. And <clears throat> I think it was them more than anything else who persuaded me that um, if you wanted to be good at anything, you had to put in a prolonged apprenticeship. And I rather liked that, the fact that things didn't come easy. Mm. I never believed that you could become really good at anything just on the strength of natural talent alone. Did Elf, um, there, there was you and Glenn at this stage, uh, let's say you were eight or ten years old, mm. ten, you know, twelve and nine sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Did Elf invest time in, in the both of you? Oh, they put huge amounts of time into us. They always said, well, we don't have much money, but what we have <coughs> is um, a willingness to put time into us. So they took us to events. I mean, we went to rugby games, we went to cricket matches. Um, we always had a bat and a ball or a racket. <coughs> um, myself and my other brother, Greg, you know, who's 19 years younger than me, um, from the day <coughs> we were you know, knee-high to a grasshopper, as I used to say, um, we were taught how to throw, how to catch, how to play straight, how to concentrate, technique, temperament, um, um, tenacity, three T's as it were. Um, if you wanted to be any good, you had to do all that sort of stuff. Um, and um, Dad would play outside with us on the footpath, come across to the park. My two cousins would come off to the, across to the park where the used to be studios there for Radio New Zealand there, that little park there. We'd play there. I mean, one of my most vivid memories of being down here was in the, on the summer evenings, just on dark, 
and that was the mothers would come out to the gate and yell out and call out to the kids to come home. For tea? Life, well, no, just because you shouldn't be out after dark. Oh. But, <clears throat> I mean, we went off down to the wharves fishing, oh. you know, eight, nine, ten years of age. Oh. And we'd be away for hours. You got on the bike and you went. Um, don't talk to me about the Health and Safety Act. Right. <laughs> I won't. Tell, tell us about the Leith. <clears throat> Because the Leith figured significantly when you when the family shifted into into the house on Harbour Terrace. Yes. Well, the Leith for me was like the Amazon. I mean, that's that's a bit of a stretch. That is a simile, really. But um, I suppose I started to read a column by Dryfly in the Evening Star every Thursday night. Dryfly wrote about fishing in Otago and Southland and in the Mackenzie. Yeah. And I almost slavered. Yeah. And I bought a fishing licence from the white sports shop just around the corner on 4th Street along next to the Wrecking Coleman building, or it used to be Wrecking Coleman, and started fishing in the Leith. And it teemed with trout in those days. It was healthy. How old were you when you bought your licence? I must have been about nine, I think. Mm. Nine or ten, and I would come home and throw the school bag away. We walk up to the George Street Normal School and back. We'd take just about a half an hour to get there mm. um, until we moved to the models by the old um, teach, um, phys ed school, yeah. part of the university. Um, but you know, I would I would grab my rod and a few little wobblers and spoons and a few wet flies and and or with some worms, and I'd be off up the Leith. I'd start fishing at the 4th Street Bridge. I knew every pool in the Leith between there and the top of Woodhaw. There wasn't that ghastly channel there in those days. There were fish in every pool. And um, <coughs> that's where I learned you, to fish. You knew them by name. I, oh, was, I just loved it. Mm. Mm. And I, I found rivers and streams magical. You once told me that when you were living in, mm. in Clermiston Avenue, mm -hmm. up in Christophan there, yeah. in the State House, yeah. that you could look out, or was it you and your dad used to look out inland That's to right. the faraway hills of, yeah. of Central Otago? Yeah, well for us, the Central Otago started with the Lamalore and the Lammermoor. And if you're looking from Clermiston Avenue where we were, you look past the right edge of Saddle Hill, and then you had the Mungatuas, as we called them. And farther off, particularly in winter, you would see that band of white. And Alf would say, you know, if you misbehave, I'll take you up, you, up there and, and I'll leave you there and you'll freeze to death in the frozen wastes, you know. But for us, and he would say, you know, the Lamalore and the Lamamore, wild places. So it was a sort of mythic um, mm. landscape mm. even even early on for you? It was. There was a sort of a sense of promised land. Mm. Um, wonderful things could happen there. There would be discoveries to be made of places which uh, were fabled, as it were, um, which I hoped to experience and become familiar with. You would... I think he was implying that you would find out things about yourself there. You would come one day to see that not only are you looking at the mountains, but the mountains are looking at you and saying, can you see yourselves in us? Sounds a bit like you speaking there. Mm. Um, no, it was, uh, that's was a that paraphrase him? of what Lawrence Durrell was mm. talking about. Yeah. So did he in, other words, you'll, in other words, you'll be greatly influenced by your experiences of landscapes and skyscapes and rivers and streams and tussock grasslands. We would go to Lake Mahinarangi on the weekends fishing. Because mm. when I started to read a lot about fishing, I said, hey, I want to go to the southern lakes. I want to go to the Mackenzie country and so on. So in some ways we introduced our parents, or I did, to those places. Right. And Mahinarangi was a place I loved too because 
The sou'wester came bursting across the Lammermoor and the Lammerlaws and that rolling country. It was all swathed in tussock. Tussock throbbed and thrashed in the wind. Elf would say, if we drive off the gravel road here, it won't matter. We'll just come to a halt on the tussocks and we'll get out and we'll snuggle down and wait. And you would be, and all the cicadas and everything would, would be blown into Lake Mahinarangi and the fish would swim by four or five yards then out from that and go. It was terrific. Yeah. And we'd come home in the evenings and we'd be in the back seat of the old Chrysler and mum and dad in the front and we'd sing, you know, kisses sweeter than wine and red, oh, you know, all sorts of Red sails in the sunset. Red sails in the sunset far out on the bay. And they were some of the happiest times that I remember. Oh. We'd, have a, we'd have a nice big brown trout in the boot wrapped up in wet grass and stuff. Yeah. And we'd, have, we'd had a picnic during the day, you know, boiled eggs and tomatoes and cheese and lettuce and a thermos and so on and so on. We'd have, a, we'd have the thermet or whatever you called them. Thermet, yeah. Yeah. With the wee fire. Yeah. Mm. And I, th I thought it was fantastic. Mm. In those days, <clears throat> I wrote about it later, I said I really, it was probably about that time that I thought we lived in a place as close to paradise as any left on earth. And my determination to try to do my best to save this place from what wasn't described then as development, which I call often destruction, um, <clears throat> I realise now that, that that's where that intense feeling I had for our place began. Now, did that come out of you alone, or was that encouraged? Was that the sort of thing that was spoken about with mum and dad, or...? Yeah, well, Alf especially and Mum, they loved the outdoors. Right. Um, but a high proportion of people from working class families, as they were called in those days, in the days when Mum was aw more aware of class here, those sorts of classes, and also when the gap between whatever one means by rich and poor was like that rather than like this, mm -hmm. and so on. in those days, they tended to the view that... Um, we were very lucky to be living here. Things were getting better in ways which made sense and weren't too exploitative. Um, and they were of the view that all of the best things about what was out there in nature would probably endure. <coughs> um, we didn't know then what we know now. Um, um, Progress perhaps meant something broader than it means now, it seems to me. Progress has become more and more related to material things and possessions, mm. ostentation, and money. bigger pile and money. Mm. Whereas in those days, um, if you could be rich in other than a, a monetary terms right. then. <coughs> and I always felt a richness when I was young and in my teens. And one of the reasons I wrote that book, Somebody's and Nobody's, which ends when I'm 25, <laughs> um, was because I got heartily sick of people telling me in the 70s and 80s in particular that New Zealand was a terribly dull place, an awful place to live in way back in the 50s and 60s. Mm. And how unfortunate we were it wasn't to be in you. New Zealand then. It wasn't for me. Mm. <coughs> at all. And I thought there were some very, very good things about life in those days which, you know, one perhaps could say we've lost. Just, just uh, and thoughts occurred <coughs> to me, at this stage, you know, your, your formative years, 10 to 15 sort of thing, did you ever go to the North Island? Not at that age. No. I don't, I can't recall when I went, first went to the North Island. When I did go there to work, Mm. Um, that was in 1968, school. I think. Mm. My grandmother, Liz, said, what do you want to go to Wellington for? What's wrong with Dunedin? Mm. And I couldn't think that there was much wrong with Dunedin, frankly. I went to Christchurch a few times. I went to Nelson to play hockey at secondary school level. Yeah. I went to Christchurch to play cricket, I think. Um, I went to Levin once to play in an inter-school hockey tournament. Oh, that well, meant going to Christchurch on the train and across on the ferry and mm. <laughs> catching a bus to Levin. Okay. Big but, adventure. But my point really is that <coughs> you were largely anchored in the south. Yeah. And 
your dreams were southern dreams even then. Oh, weren't they? absolutely. Mm. Yeah, they have always, always have been, really. Mm. Um, I've never believed that somewhere else, elsewhere, was necessarily better. It would, I always termed it different. And I was always interested, in, as I always have been, in anywhere new and different. But I didn't assume, as a lot of New Zealanders seem to have assumed, that you couldn't lead a um, stimulating and satisfying life in southern New Zealand or anywhere else in New Zealand. And that happiness wasn't dependent on, on yeah. money. Yeah. Those values still very yeah. much apply to you, don't they? Yeah. Both of those things. Yeah. I want to go back to the, to the household just briefly. You've become uh, probably best known uh, as a writer now, although we will traverse the very many other things that you have achieved. Um, tell me more about books. What was in the house? What, did, what, what was the stimulus there, or was there a stimulus? There was, because Louis, Lou, my father's father, was a great reader, as he was called those days. <laughs> He said, I'll never have the money to travel the world, but I can travel the world in books. So <clears throat> he encouraged me and others to read. But if you're a reader, you're somewhat intimidating for some people. My grandmother Liz, his, uh, Louis's um, wife, she wasn't all that keen on reading because readers seem to be often a world of their own and that, you know, raises some difficulties. But he would come home with lots of books, often travel books. He also read Wide World magazine, Parade, and so on and so on. And he would bring up um, things which he'd learned from that. He read Popular Mechanics as well. He was a do-it-yourselfer. So, so I think it was probably Lou that encouraged me to read. Your grandfather. Yeah. What, what was the first book that, that really <laughs> affected you? Oh. I can't remember much about it now. It wasn't to affect me. I do remember it, though, because I found it amusing. Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <excellent. laughs> I always used to read above what, you know, what the level I was capable of any um, uh, informed understanding. I, mean, I can remember at secondary school I would get out books, among, other, uh, among the Alistair Maclean's and all the other stuff. I would get out Chinese philosophy, and I remember getting Bertrand Russell or R Bertrand Russell's works out, because I wanted to educate myself, as it were. And I, I Grapes of Wrath, Steinbeck, Steinbeck's the Grapes of Wrath. I remember reading that and being, you know, um, at high school. Saying, we're talking about. What's that? You'd be at high school. Yeah, I was. Uh, probably about fifth form level then. Hmm. Um, I can't remember a lot of the books I read when I was younger but, younger, but I was quite voracious in that regard. Although we were always encouraged to get outside and play, Lucy. Get mm. outside and play. Mm. We had plenty of play. I, I, I suppose we were always, Glenn and I and Greg as well, there was never enough time for everything. I've never been able to understand or sympathise with anyone who tells me they're bored. If someone tells me something is boring, or they're bored, I, as indelicately as possible, write them off. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. On the notion of play, um, I have in my mind uh, a lovely picture of you and Glenn in ongoing day after day cricket matches out the back in the house in Harbour Terrace. Yes. Where Glenn was it you told me or Glenn told me he, he learned to play a straight on drive because it, it got the ball down the alleyway? Down the alleyway between the, the brick two story place next door. Mm. You had to be able to hit it slightly wide of mid on to get it down there. So you meant that you had to wait for the ball to come on and t turn the wrists a bit, <coughs> the left arm, top hand always as a batsman. Elf, my father, would say, you play with your top hand. And Glenn will say, your top hand is the crucial hand, no bottom hand, as little as possible. You roll the bat and you could put it down the alley. Now, if it was him and me, whoever was bowling, you'd have to run across the garden, a little bit of garden, 
sharp right down the alley and if it might even run out onto the street. Yeah. Now you could run four in that time right. and we always kept a score. Mm. Right. And, and, and if you hit it straight to mid on, you would hit the window. My grandmother would be standing there with her arms covered in flour and a tea towel and come running out and whip, whip you around the legs with a wet tea towel. <laughs> <laughs> and was over the fence out? Hey? Was over the fence out? Oh, well, you couldn't hit it over the fence because there was no fit. The, the only fence was behind. Right. And there was a. And also shed. behind was, it was the towering bulk of Greg's yes, factory, wasn't it? Which belched. Yeah, I love, lot, I love this. Smelled and, and, and Greg's coffee. Yeah, mm. so that was, you know, about coffee three, and chicory. Three, three houses along. Yeah, chicory, yeah. yeah so oh, it was a very aromatic place, Graham. It was, I yeah. can tell that. Mm. But was it just you and Glenn? Was it just the two boys playing after school? Oh, we had the Sutherland boys for a little while who were on the corner. Um, but it was mainly Glenn and me mm. and Alf and my grandfather Lou when they got and also the work. two Larkins boys. Right. You know, um, who, I mean, Alan won, twice won the New Zealand Junior Road Championships before he turned 19, which is pretty good. Mm. He was also a good runner. He had the Tugger Southland um, Secondary Schools 440 um, fastest for that for about 25 years. Right. He could have been a runner. Mm. But no, Alf would come out. Alf, Alf, Alf used to bowl leg brakes at us. No control, but could spin it, um, and Lou would by and large bowl underarm at us. Mm. Uh, the Larkins boys would come out and do it a bit, but it was mainly Glenn and me. Mm. We had test matches. Getting it, was it on grass or on, on concrete? No, well, <coughs> it was on the footpath outside, but in the or on the, on the park over there, and the pop, one of the poplar trees was the wicket. But Jim mm. and Alan Larkins would come over and bowl to us, mm. and we'd play over there. But I mean out yeah. the back of the house? Out the back of the house, it was just a little square of concrete. Was it? Right. Yeah, it was only very small. Mm. But we also played rugby in the park. And we played rugby in the street. We had a, you know, forcing back at the rugby ball and you'd, the, the gutter was the touchline mm -hmm. and you'd punt it to you. We got very good. Glenn and I would have both played rugby if we'd been bigger. Yeah. I'm quite convinced we'd have been all blacks, frankly. Yeah. At this stage, um, <laughs> at this stage, Elf, who, who is a massive influence on you, everyone <coughs> recognises. Um, was he in a good state? I mean, this was post-war. It seems to me that Elf battled with frustration. Oh, absolutely. Ab exasperated. He? He, he felt that most of his, many of the possibilities that he might have had had been taken away from him. Mm. Remember, he, By the he war. was taken out of school at 12. Right. And um, was resentful of that all his life. And he had a very good mm. agile brain health. He felt mm. that he was cleverer than most of the chaps mm. he, um, of his generation. I mean, he wouldn't have said that, mm. but he felt he was at least as intelligent as most of them and that if he'd only he'd gone through school. Mm. Um, but the problem with him was that... <clears throat> And at one point there, when he was a young guy, he, he, he had a milk run in the morning. Um, he worked in a bike shop during the day, and he worked for a while there anyway, selling lollies in the cinema and picture theatre and stuff. Um, when he came back from the war and I was there, and three years and a bit later, Glenn was there, um, he didn't... He didn't, either didn't want to or didn't see or didn't want, uh, felt he couldn't um, go and try and get what everyone called an education. Then. Was it too late? He felt it, I think he felt it was too late. Mm. Um, but he was putting a lot of time into the cycling club, the novices and the whole works. Mm. But he railed against that for most of his life, yeah. really. What about yeah. your mum? Well, mum was, mum has always just been, well, there's... Alf's mother put it, uh, you know, she was a great mum. Um, reliable, um, able, doting, um, like all most of the women those days, a good cook, good provider. She sewed and she knitted. Did she work uh, beyond the house? She did occasional part-time work here and there. Mum and Dad both for a while 
Oh, for many years, actually, they did a couple of hours cleaning in schools around the place. They cleaned across the road at the Dunedin North Intermediate. They, and uh, some years later, they used to go clean the Bayfield High School. Was, um, by that time, you know, Dad was driving for William Wrights and then Lawrence, and so he went mm. to work at five in the morning or early, and, right. and, um, and so on. So they always did that. Mum, mum handled all the money. She took <coughs> Alf's pay, put some in the bank for a two weeks holiday at the end of the year, in January usually, um, and she put aside enough for all the necessities. Mm. And then, um, then she gave Alf his, his weekly allowance. <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> and, and of course in those days, you never bought anything until you'd saved up enough to pay for it. Mm. So credit, we were quite cards. frugal like that. Credit cards not mm. on the scene. Yeah. Was it a volatile marriage? Um, at times, yeah. Even then? Yep, at times, yeah. Uh, mainly, mainly Dad's exasperation, really. Mm. Um, yeah, because on the one hand, he was... Yeah, I suppose it's true to say that Elf away from home as the life and soul of the party at home. Um, you know, his anger came out from mm. time to time. But he wasn't a violent man or anything like that. Mm. Mm. Let's, let's um, go back to you at Tiger Boys High. Yeah. Um, first of all, did you enjoy the classroom? Were you a happy student? No, for the first year in particular, I was terrified a lot of the time. Um, uh, I, I was always a nervy kid, um, and um, and uh, I never felt that I had sufficient uh, confidence in my own abilities and uh, in the parlance of later years, you know, I wondered whether I could actually hack it there. I was a bit overwhelmed by it all, really. Um, I was also put in a class that I didn't think I ought to be in. Um, we all set a test, I think, the first week or two when we went there, and they put me in the top third form class, and I thought that was preposterous. Um, I knew I wasn't that bright. Um, but what that meant was that I had to take Latin and French and do chemistry. <laughs> and I was really no good at any of those things. I wanted to do English, um, geography, history. Um, but you couldn't do all of that. So um, second year, or oh, was it? Maybe it was fifth form, by the time fifth form. I was not doing Latin anymore and I'm not even sure I did chemistry in the fifth form. I'm not sure, frankly. I mean, I may have been able to get pass marks in them if I did the right amount of work, but you can't do a lot of schoolwork and go fishing and play cricket and play hockey and go to cycling and read and go all that sort of thing as well, I found. You know, um, and... Uh, so, yeah, although those who knew me there seemed to think that I appeared to have confidence. Mm. Mm. And I was in the first hockey eleven from in the 4 form, so mm. I was there for four years. And, um, you know, in the first 11 for three years. So presumably you were sporting... both those teams, so... Yeah, you captain both of them. Your sporting mm. abilities established you um, at a level of, of confidence <laughs> and self-confidence as well as in the eyes of others. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it gives you some cred mm. there. Um, and others pick you. One mm. doesn't pick oneself. You know. um, and if you get appointed captain, you don't put your hands up and say, I want to be captain. I just said, all right, I'll do it. Mm. Um, the... Um, the home environment, as they say, there was so much talk about sport and how to go about sport um, that 
I thought I knew how to play games. Um, Glenn and I and my brother Greg were, others tell me, very good at almost everything we played. Um, and uh, so I had some confidence there. Mm. At this stage, because uh, Greg is not born. No. He's the autumn leaf that, that flits right. into the picture much later. Yeah, Greg, Greg, Greg often used to say that he felt he had three fathers mm. rather than two brothers. Mm. Well, 19 years is a, is a fairly impressive mm. margin. Mm. Um, at school, was there a teacher that had a profound influence or did you, do you not recall any significant others like that? Well... <laughs> None that had a profound influence, but there were a few that I, uh, well, let's say I liked mm. um, or respected. Um, I didn't dislike many of them. Um, I always felt that in any relationship, uh, any they like now call environment, you have to bring a lot to it yourself. We never had high expectations except of ourselves. By and large, I liked Ernie French. He had a bit of a temper. That was all right. Mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't get away these days with behaving like Ernie did from time to time, but all right. Mm. Doug White, who was a bit notorious, talked a lot, quite a bit about himself. But I liked Doug White, taught history. Um, was he one of those teachers that won the war? I had several of those. <laughs> <laughs> On his own, he won. Well, it. I don't know whether he'd gone to the war, you see. Right. Um, but he may have been in the Navy or whatever. Mm. There was a chap, Jim Porter, who was in the Territorials. Who, um, so was big into cadets. The, the, and mocked a little as a consequence of that. Mm. Um, no, I, I can't think of... Oh. Bill Duncan, I think that was his name. Um, he, in my last year at school, I think I was in his geography class. Um, one, he was unobtrusive, didn't shout. Um, also, he would just tell boys if they didn't, if they didn't want to work or so on, or they were going to make a noise, go to the back of the class and shut up. I thought that made perfect sense. You wouldn't be allowed to do that today. The teacher would be held responsible. I always felt that the boys should be held responsible for their behaviour, you know. Yeah. I think teachers are among the most put upon people in New Zealand life. Yeah. Frank Cameron was a character. He, um, I actually learned a bit from Frank because Frank was a bloody good runner. He trained really hard. And I, in, in, our, in our family, we applauded people who did that. Um, he was a really good opening bowler. Otago and for New Zealand. While and you were at school, he, he, he was, was in he it was then. He was in it then. Um, you know, um, Frank felt he had ability and presence, um, which he did. Mm. And um, he was a yeoman. He came in and he bowled over after over after over, put it on the spot, and so on and so on. Mm. And uh, you know, I was, you know, I was. Well, I had some admiration for that. Right, what's conspicuously lacking from these recollections is anything about writing. Uh, that's true. <clears throat> Although I liked English more than any other subject, um, and um, uh, it was Baby Arnold, Theo Arnold, who introduced me to poetry. I thought he was a very good English teacher. He would get us to read in class, <coughs> whether we liked to or not. Read out loud. Read out loud from time to time. Um, he, you know, the, Arnold's the Forsaken Merman, I remember, you know. Sandstream caverns cool and deep where the winds are all asleep where the salt weed sways in the stream, you know. <laughs> heavy in the alliteration and the, essence, mm. the sibilance, whatever you like. Um, mm. But that, very good of its kind, that sort of writing. Um, he also had us to read parts of the way, um, Eliot, 
bits and pieces of the wasteland out loud. Mm. And um, uh, the one that he knew, this is the way the world ended, you know, not with a bang, but a whimper, mm. and so mm. on and so on. And of course, when you're a teenager, and the end of the world is nigh, the, the earth uh, ending not with a bang, but a whimper, you know, it spoke mm. volumes, really. So on the one hand, you had Arnold, um, uh, Matthew Arnold, um, and on the other, T.S. Eliot, two rather different. I mean, you right. might have had some marvel as well, you know. Um, the graves are fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. In other words, make the most of your time here. Mm. You know, mm. that spoke to me at that time. So I was reading a lot of books outside of... I don't think I ever read entirely right through a set book at school. I was doing all my reading. I was reading what I wanted to read, not necessarily what the school wanted me to read. So there was no way in the world I was going to read all of a George Eliot novel. I wasn't going to read all of Silas Marner. I took the moral out mm. of Silas Marner, but no more for me. Not then. I, I used to think then, as I still do now, that at, uh, at secondary school level then, and also at stage one university level from time to time, um, people were required to read above what they were capable of apprehending rather than the other way around. And were you writing at all for your <laughs> own purposes at school, or did that not happen at that stage? <laughs> I started to try to write a few limericks because I found them funny, maybe Arnold also got us to read a few limericks. Just give us a range of stuff. Mm. Um, and, you know, of course we had Wordsworth, the Daffodils, and yep. whatever. So you didn't uh, keep a diary or anything like that? No, I didn't. Um, I started to write things down in my first and second years out of school. Right. That's when I started to try to write poems and often maudlin references to life and living. Mm. Adolescent uh, stuff. Yeah. Um, see the slow motion disintegration of white clouds in the blue. Was this you? Yes, that was me. Yeah. Right. I was lying on. I remember well, lying in the backyard, looking up at the sky, right. thinking, you know, I was destined for a very short life. Yes, we'll pause know. for a collective groan. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. Mm. Yeah. So, but uh, when, that's, that's when I went the, to Christchurch, I was twenty. I got promoted in the customs no, department. Uh, well, let's go to it yeah. step by step. Right. Um, end of school. Mm. I mean, school was clearly a sporting uh, arena for you. Yeah. Your greatest successes were in sport, mm. hockey, cricket. Mm. Well, uh, I'd been playing for Otago at hockey and cricket at the time, you know, in my late teens, mm. um, men's teams. Yeah. Or the actual the cricket I played for the under-20s national tournament Otago team. I'd also played senior cricket by that time. Mm. Um, and I was, you know, before I was 20, I was, I think I might have, I was definitely reserved for the South Island senior men's team at hockey. Mm. Well, we're not quite at 20 yet. <coughs> you're, you're pushing all right, all forward right. here yeah. far too fast. Okay. Because it's, it's an interesting question now. End of school, chums like me automatically jump on the, the tram and go to university. Mm. What did you do? I got a job in the customs department. What the grandparents and my cousins and uncles said would be a good, steady job. They'd all known times of considerable unemployment, difficulty getting work, and they thought, work for the government, government department, that's saying you'll probably always have a job. That was the most important thing. Yep. No one in our no one that we knew had been to university. There Did it no just never come up? Well, it certainly at school. I didn't get accredited university entrance first time at secondary school. I had to go back for another year, fifth year, to get that. And the head, Ted Aim, was very pissed off about it. Um, everyone said to me at school, you'll get accredited because you're the school's opening batsman. Yep. <laughs> We're bloody, the time the university entrance examinations are, are on coincide with the annual inter-school against Christ College. <laughs> now, Ted would just love us to beat Christ College. <laughs> and when I didn't get accredited, they said, oh, Christ. Well, you know, you'd so be pissed I, off too, wouldn't you? 
I wasn't all that pissed off about it. I okay. thought, oh, well, I, I, I wasn't pissed off about it because I, my marks hadn't been good enough. Right. So you, you know, expected it, really? So I expected it. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, for, for school certificate, I only got two marks over 50. You see, 48 right. for maths and 44 for French. Right. Um, my, my best mark was in English, and even that wasn't very good. Mm. I got over 50 in history. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, so university really didn't figure? No, well, I didn't think I was bright enough. Mm. And no I was probably in the second top class at school, about that level, I suppose. Right. Um, but I had no, I didn't want to be, I thought, what could I do if I got a Bachelor of Arts degree? I mean, we're very pragmatic, sort of matter yeah. of fact, mm. about things. You had to recognise, don't get too big for your boots um, and all the rest of it. Um, mm. Self praise is no recommendation, was mm. no skiting. <laughs> um, so I thought, well, what would I do if I got a BA degree? Could I even get one? And I thought, well, I'd either be a librarian or a teacher. I didn't want to be either of those things, even though I admire teachers as much or more than any thing, really, in the professions. <coughs> but that's another story. Um, so I, so it didn't occur to me, even though many of my mates tried to persuade me to go there. What did you want to be? I didn't know. Right. <coughs> um, um, I, at, at that stage, I wanted to continue playing sport. I actually did want to play sport for New Zealand. Mm. And I'd said to Glenn when I was 19 that I didn't want to keep playing senior cricket and representative hockey. I, I felt that playing both of them in one year constantly was more than I wanted to entertain. Glenn said, OK, well, because Glenn was a marvellous hockey player. Mm. Um, he said, yeah, well, I want to be a professional cricketer, which is unheard of for anyone from here. Well, those days. So I said to Glenn, I'll play hockey. He said, I'll play cricket. <clears throat> so I got in the New Zealand team at the age of 21 or 20 or whatever it was. And Glenn went off to England when he was 19 on spec mm. and got himself a contract with Worcester and played there for, you know, long time. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> and and by these late teens, I mean you you left school, you've joined the customs department in Dunedin. Is this not when the tramping life began? Yeah, when I went uh, um, no the tramping life I we're mad keen fishermen all all over Otago and South and right through to the end of and beyond school. Right. When I went to Christchurch um, I always hungered for it to do as many things as possible because I thought a lifetime... If for me, I never thought I'd make old bones even then. Was Christchurch, <laughs> was Christchurch your first job? Or was that no, no, in Dunedin was right. the job. I was here for a couple of years right. and then got promoted very early in the department. I, by that time, I'd, I'd been to university for a term mm. because my mates talked me into taking two units part-time. At Otago, yeah. At Otago. So I thought, oh, all right. What it's units? English and history. All right. <clears throat> Absolutely useless I was. I thought I got a D and a B or something for two assignments. Um, and uh, we had to, which I didn't read, of course, um, read Spencer's The Fairy Queen. I mean, at stage one, reading The Fairy Queen, how are you going to do that unless you're a brilliant person? Mm. Um, it's an allegory, you know, all the seven deadly sins keep coming up. Lenore Harty said to me in the tutorial, I ventured to go to one once, she said to me, oh, green in this passage that I've just read, and looked around, I thought, oh, no. She asked me, she said, what does green denote here? And I went, oh, uh, grass. <laughs> Others in the tutorial thought it was very funny, and she said, oh, very droll, very dry, she said, but envy, of course, is what's standard <laughs> here. <clears throat> yeah, not so good. So I copied out part of Barry Marshall's assignment, I think, for that one. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. But was he any good? Barry wrote <laughs> was about half as much as I did and got as good or better marks. Yeah. 
He was he he, he was smarter than me. Well, I had Neil Pitchers copy my English essays. <laughs> he, he did very well. <laughs> I, Willie Morrell was in the history, but anyway, I got promoted, so that was the end of my career. I went yeah. to Christchurch. Did you live at home while you were working in the customs yeah. department? Yeah, I, yeah, I did. I got my I had a suitcase and my cricket bat and my hockey gear, and I went off to Christchurch. Right. We were living opposite the Bayfield. One, one gets the feeling that you yeah. you can't have had much uh, <clears throat> ambition vested in the customs department was it just a way of sort of getting to from one sports occasion to another or? yeah well, i i i my um my second cousin tom eagleton was a coach of the christchurch boys high school team which contributed quite a lot of people to the olympic um, gold medal team in montreal mm. when i played with for new zealand with those guys and and played for canterbury when I was up there, because I got in the Canterbury team the first so how long time I went there. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, well, <coughs> you were known as a hockey player down here, mm. so they welcomed you there, I presume. Mm. Um, and that's when the tramping began. Yeah, I, when I got up there I, in the customs department, I met a guy, um, Bernie Hack, who was in the Christchurch Tramping and Mountaineering Club. Fit fella, really fit, Bernie. Been a bike rider and he's good at running. And I always wanted to go to the mountains. Because when we were going fishing and we went over to Melford a few times, when we periodically went to Fiordland on our fishing holidays, <coughs> it was when I found out I got school certificate first time, for God's sake, you know. Because we went to the Cascade store, we were in the camping ground there and got the ODT two or three days later. And Your name to was my surprise, my name was... And a D. But anyway, when we were going over to Milford, we were going up the upper Holyford, and I looked up and I could see this big cape of snow on, um, on the ridge of Mount Crosscut. And way up there high against this brilliant blue sky, you could see, I swear to this day, I could just see the bend in a rope joining two guys who were climbing up the ridge up there. And I looked up and I remember saying to mum and dad, you know, gee, I'd love to be up there. Mm. And, you know, my grandmother would say, there's no way we'd go up there, that's crazy do that but I thought no I'm going to do that one day mm. so when I went to Christchurch I told Bernie that I'd be keen to go out with him so I started going out we used to catch the train to um, Arthur's Pass the rail car on Friday night after work and come back on the rail car on Sunday night after work mm. and I just felt you know it was fantastic we used to walk, we'd walk up in the moonlight up the Waimakariri River up to Andy Crow Hut get there at one in the morning, be up and away at 5.30 in the morning, swinging, swinging along, packs on. Boy, I mean, that was a freedom like nothing else. Looking up at the mountains and saying, you know, by the time I was 21 or so, 22, I'd been up on most of those peaks at Arthur's Pass. And the experience was exhilarating beyond compare. You know, and you felt sort of renegade too, you know? Mm. No one knew where you were and what you were doing. And you'd come back to work on Monday. And you felt daring too. Mm. Courageous, daring, fit. Boy, it was, mm. it was scintillating, really. Mm. And you eventually climbed Mount Cook, of course. Mm. Yeah, well, Phil Temple and I eventually climbed Mount Cook. I don't know when that was. It must have been in the late 70s. Um, yeah, first time for me. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> first attempt. Phil had tried a couple of times before that, as I've often reminded him. Yeah, he, I, he, I always tell him he's the only man I ever knew who fell off Mount Cook twice and survived. <laughs> 34. Mm. Yeah, very lucky, actually. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's a notable achievement, getting there, <coughs> of course. That's, uh, in anyone's yeah. book, that puts you in a rare club. Well, it was a big day, that one. Mm. Mm. Standing on the summit of Cook. Mm. Yeah, then you've got to get down. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Mm. Um, so Christchurch was a good period. This was a, a period of sort of indulgence in all the things that you were learning to love a great deal that were mm. hugely um, influential on, on your thinking today, wasn't it, with this exposure to the wilderness and, and naturalness mm -hmm. and mm. also um, your rather significant element of, of man aloneness. Well, I went with people. Yeah. You see, uh, fellowship, comradeship mm. is 
what I've loved most about the outdoors, even though I can be alone in the outdoors, but not lonely. Mm. Um, it's very fulfilling to be out there. You know, one can, in a way, commune with something bigger than yourself and more significant than most other people believe themselves to be. But I, some good things happened to me up there. Because I played club cricket. Um, I did a lot of tramping and climbing. Um, I toured Australia with the New Zealand hockey team. Played for Canterbury, won the Challenge Shield a couple of times. Um, and I guess <coughs> we'd had a kind of apprenticeship in Dunedin through our family in the circle. Um, we'd learnt to, to respond reasonably well to pressure. Um, and I rather liked the fact that I could play at the highest level and play well there and that I didn't fold under, under the gun, as it were. And I, one of the things that... It confirmed what we, my father in particular and others had told us, that um, without sound technique you have nothing. Um, your technique has to be good enough so that you can do... You can put things into practice unthinkingly. <coughs> Because there isn't time to think about technique and so on under pressure at the highest level. Mm. It has to be able to hold up. Yeah. <coughs> um, <coughs> and anyone who says that you can get away with just flair, yeah. natural talent, they're bullying you. They're just trying to take the easy way out. You know? <coughs> well, practice until it becomes habit. And well, Sir Walter always used to say, um, you know, there is no, he used to hammer it in to us all, there is no substitute for skill, he would say. It's, well, you would know that as a painter, mm. an artist, whatever area. Um, I know that as a writer, you've got to have technique, you've got to have knowledge, you've got to be well informed, you've got to be able to interpret, so on, you've got to visualise. You know, in a sporting field, you've got to know where you are on the field in relation to others. Then mathematics come in, equidistance to other people in order not to allow the opposition space to get in between you mm. and, and, be, and, and break open, you know, all that kind of thing. <clears throat> Another thing that happened yeah. in Christchurch, uh, you got married. Oh, yes, I did. Uh, did I? No, I was in Wellington by the time I got married. Still on I the met the department? woman I married when you, I was yeah, you in met Christchurch. Her, okay. That's right. You, were you still with Customs in Wellington? This, this Custom House career was no, forging ahead? No, I wasn't. Ahead? I was not um, because I left Christchurch. I resigned from the Customs Department and came back to Otago where I worked as a builder's labourer for Jock Wurgis at the time for a while. I worked in the bakehouse or packing bread off the conveyor belts at Lawrenson's. I worked on the rabbit board for a few months in central Otago. At Dex. Um, Why and, did you, you know, resign? Huh? Why did you resign? Because I looked around me, and I don't mean this condescendingly, but I thought, as a middle-aged and older man, I don't want still to be work, working in a quasi-office environment in the government department. Mm. I wanted to do as many things as I could possibly manage, and I didn't think that I was fitted for that. Yeah. Um, I, I had not, I don't, I was not a bureaucratic minded individual, mm. and um, I don't like, you break with convention at your peril, but sometimes you have to. Yeah. I didn't like conformity for conformity's sake. So I came back south, and I wanted to go back south because I knew what I loved about the south. Yeah. And I said, I'll see what happens to me. My father was furious, throwing it away. What are you going to do? Mm. He didn't want me back home anyway. Um, but then when I was working in the bakehouse here, I was working with John Dixon, also a poet. It wasn't then, but doing an MA, I think, on, on Lowry, actually, under the volcano. Right. Oh, man. He was married, had a couple of kids and so on. We were sitting at about midnight in the tea room up in Lawrenson's there and looking at the New Zealand listener and he s said, here's a job that might suit you because we used to talk about books and that all the time. You know. And uh, I mean, he said up there, you've got to read Naked Lunch by William Burroughs. I said, no way I'm going to read a, a psychedelic 
F wit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he looked there, and there was a job with Oxford University Press's New Zealand branch in Wellington, someone who wanted to do a general factotum's job there. He said, this might suit you. So I applied for it. Next thing, John Griffin of the University Bookshop's on the phone to me. He said, Ralph Goodridge from OUP in Wellington has rung me up and he said, I've got this application from Guy in Dunedin. He said, I'm not coming all the way down there to interview him. I'll only do that if you think it'd be worth my while. John got me into UBS in his little office early in the morning and talked to me for about 20 minutes and said, hang on a minute, rang up Wellington and said, Ralph, I've got me, I've got Brian Turner in my office. He said, if you don't give him a job, I will. So Ralph came down and talked to me and oh. said, all right, well, if you want the job, it's yours. So, so you were an editor? For well, I, I worked at all sorts of things, writing copy for catalogues. Um, I toured half the South Island, all of the South Island and half the North Island, selling books to retail bookshops, visiting secondary schools, university, university traveller. Um, I read the odd manuscript. Was this in my last year or two there with him, I, um, I, I was doing editorial work as well. Was this where your own writing really began, or you started to conceive <coughs> of yourself as a writer? Um, when I was in Christchurch working with the customs department, I had been writing quite a few things then. I wrote a couple of television reviews of all things for the listener. You could... They would publish and they'd give you a pound or ten shillings. They invited you to write? No, no, you were just invited to submit. Right. I wrote one on a documentary on Edward Elgar. I loved Elgar's music at that time. Max Adrian was, I think, played Elgar over the Morven Hills and so on. I, I was very affected by that. I still love Elgar. And I wrote one on... Um, on uh, television uh, movies of westerns, because <laughs> I like I, as a genre, I quite enjoyed those. I thought they were very, they were great comedies as well as you know. Dun -dum, dun -dum, dun -dum, dun -dum. you know mm -hmm. I found all that, and I also pub I also started sending poems to the New Zealand Monthly Review, to Uncle Ho, too late but with affection. I wrote a poem for Uncle Ho of North Vietnam when I was in the department. The heads of the department in Christchurch were so pissed off with me because they thought I was a commo. I used to buy the Vietnam Courier in, in the co-op bookshop in New Regent Street and deliberately leave it on the side of my desk. So when these guys walked by, they would see them. They would see it and they'd say, this is provocative, and they'd gather around my desk and I would have an argument with them. I would be the only one that was saying that America ought not to be in Vietnam. So, so I was writing then, and, and I but, also but by the time I got to Wellington, when I got to Wellington, when the first year or two I was there, I was trying to write poems all the time, and successive editors of the New Zealand Listeners started to publish me there. It, this, this suddenly <laughs> writing poems has, has come out of, out of nowhere. Do you, do you remember what triggered the, po the first poems? Reading other people's poems. Was it? Yeah. While, I, you were, while you were in the customs department? Yeah. I, lo I love this notion of you in the customs department. I, yeah. I would love to have seen you then. Yeah. But, but you <laughs> began... Well, I wouldn't wear a tie half the time either, and that was disapproved of deeply. You know, I was right. deemed a rebel. Mm. Mm. And was, was writing poetry part of that rebellion, part of that anti-establishment Probably. I, I, well, there were all sorts of things going on in my head, and the only way to see what I thought was to see what I'd written. Um, and, and writing is a way of honing, honing your ideas, um, learning to express yourself better. I wanted to become more articulate, fluent. I wanted to become better informed. I wanted to become more understanding, um, insightful, empathetic, all those things. Quite deliberately you were thinking like this. Yeah, yeah, I did. I thought that through books you know, they enlarged your world. Um, and I realised how ill-educated I felt I would be. I suppose I had a bit of the autodidactic in me hmm. from an early stage, but I didn't recognise it then. But I, did, I was around adults who talked a lot. You see, there was no television in the rest hmm. of it. You know? um, and, um, and, and the talk about sport and recreation was always on a level above most of the talk that you get. 
because of all this interest in technique and mm. and so on. And the, you see, sport for us was always an art. I mean, my brothers and I always, my father, we always talked about poise and grace. What Glenn and I liked about, you know, we would say, God, that guy looks good on a bike, yeah. or that guy, you know, his, his balance is wonderful, mm. and so on. Slogging was not allowed. Slog, slogging was, mm. it's village green stuff. There's a lot <coughs> of metaphorical parallels between your sporting attitudes and your attitudes to to life's values too, of course, aren't there? The, the sporting metaphor, especially the cycling one, mm. is one that I've always thought is is the metaphor for you, the, the cyclist battling away, doing it hard, doing his best, doing it really well, but pretty generally doing it by yourself. Sometimes in a in a pack, sometimes, yeah. but more often than not. Well, I would alone. prefer. Well, you and I used to train together, for instance. Mm. You learn a lot about your friends and yourself in bike cycling because more often than not. Well, a lot of times, most people train with others. It's just that where I've been a lot, at certain time I've had to train by myself. I would prefer to train with someone else. Mm. Um, so, but I've learned it's, it's a good time. You've got time to ruminate in the rest of it as well and think about stuff and you mm. get a few ideas then. But I can vividly remember when young, we're going out and follow, we'd go and follow the bike races all the time. I found that enormously interesting. And the bike riders rode in all weather, vile conditions. Mm. They were tough. And my father and them would say, and Alan would say, that guy, one of the reasons that guy is good is because he knows how to suffer. So there was always an element of pain in it. You know, and I always say when riding, and some guy would say, whenever you felt properly effed, as it were, mm. I would say to myself, one more time, mm. one more time. Mm. If it's hurting me, it's hurting them, mm. see? And anyone who gave up easily at anything, you know, Glenn would say in cricket, well, well, well he'd, Glenn would say, Nelf would say, you can't score runs if you're not at the wicket. It's simple as that, you know? Mm. So Glenn would say, right, I'm going out to bat in the early stage and I'm going to try and bat for the session. Mm. And then I'm going to try and bat for the next session. That's when he was very young. You know, by the time two years went by, you know, he batted like everyone else did. But he learned to bat by being at the wicket. It made perfect sense to us. I've got to bulldoze uh, forward, really, here. Mm -hmm. The Oxford University Press period, yeah. you were beginning to be a writer, a yep. poet, to, yep. to start to see yourself as a writer. Yeah. How long did that last with them? <coughs> and then what followed it? Well, I, I, at the age of 30, um, Oxford New Zealand manager was going to retire and they were going to send someone out from the UK. I'd been across to the UK and for a month or so and all the rest of it. And I, I was at a point where I was beginning to pine for the South Island. I didn't really want to help a, a, um, someone from the UK, from England, <coughs> to learn the ropes in New Zealand because I felt that I knew the ropes in New Zealand by that stage. Um, and I wasn't convinced that it was where I wanted to be for quite a long time. If I'd, I felt I'd got to the point whereby if I stayed there, I might just stay in publishing with OUP and I might just stay in the North Island. I, there was an offer for me to have gone to another Oxford branch and I felt I was a New Zealander and I wanted to remain one. What will I do? I, I'm amazed at, at how much, how, how readily I could make a decision in those days, which has not been the case. It's gone the other way ever since in mm. many respects. So I decided, I told Judy that I wanted us to go back to the South Island, which she didn't really want to do. I came south with Andre on the plane, this little kid between one and, well, he was wasn't two years of age. Brought him down to Needham, stayed with mum and dad for a while, got a job in the radio station here, 4XO, as a newsreader and journalist. And within a year, about a year, John McIndoe wrote me a note and said, Dennis McIldowney of Auckland University Press has told me you're here. I need an editor. Dennis said, if you... He, he, 
Dennis had said to John, if you want an editor, Brian's your man. <clears throat> I went and saw John and spoke to him for a while and, and he said, if you want the job, it's yours. Mm. That's, and I went and worked there, it changed my life. Did, and you lasted how long there? More than a decade? I, yeah, I worked for him from 1975 through to 84 when I had the Burns Fellowship and then for another year and a bit afterwards and then got out of that um, because I was then living with Barbara Larson and I knew then that if I wanted to produce a lot more work and as much work as I might be able to produce, I had to have more time to do it. As a full-time writer? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and I was writing a lot of journalism, freelance journalism, I wrote columns, mm. I did editing part-time for them. And I write other things as well. Well, you were very instrumental in helping Longacre Press establish, for example. Yeah, well, I, I, I was... I, John and I worked wonderfully well together and we published a great many books, mm. books which will last. Mm. Um, and I enlarged and extended the range of authors that he had and, and the variety of discovering books. Discovering Owen Marshall, I seem to recall. Well, not quite Discovering Owen. He published a book through um, Pegasus, I think it was, or Caxton. Supper Walsh. Yeah, Supper Walsh Wilson. But then I and then Barbara published mm. several of Owen's books. Mm. Published Vince O'Sullivan, Noel Hilliard, Ted Middleton, republished Honey Too Fari and New Honey Too Fari. All manner of people, Harry Morton, some of the best, Rosemary McLeod, the best Tom Scott, Zealand, and all, most of whom have been Burns Fellows. Incidentally. Monty Holcroft, mm. you know, lots and lots of people. Mm. Yeah, that was a very good time. I want to, <coughs> before we wind up, we've, we've got you up to the, the writer uh, that you are now so widely recognised uh, for being. Um, I want to ask a a tricky question, really. It's one that puzzles me You'd never do that, Graham, but carry on. No, it, it's, um, <laughs> it's possibly unanswerable, but it, it does fascinate me, this one. What's poetry for? Po what is poetry for? Hmm. Well, there's no finer way of saying things. Um, it's... Why not it, write it in prose? Well, there's a crossover between sometimes people talk about poetic prose or prose poetry, don't mm -hmm. they? Mm -hmm. um, poetry, um, you discover the music in language. You discover sonorities that you've never heard before. Um, you couldn't have conceived of. You find yourself saying things that you could never have thought you would have had to say. Um, it's a condition uh, and a compulsion. I love the rhythms in verse. I love the concision in verse. Um, I love the profundity, if it's not too big a word, and the wisdom that can be um, uncovered and laid bare. I love the candour, the frankness, um, the pathos. All of those things <coughs> are in poetry. All of those things are very much at the heart of what makes human beings what they are. Um, and I've never found those things to that degree and in intensity in any other form of writing. <coughs> um, much as I love good prose and, much, and I've written huge amounts of it, <coughs> The prose I like best in the end is prose that sings. So I can't sing, but I can sing sometimes in language, in words, with words. And um, there's an exultancy about all that. And sometimes I read something that someone else has written and think, that is just wonderful. Thank you very much for doing that. It's a gift. A gift. To others. Yes. Most certainly it is. Does it come easy? <clears throat> I've never found anything much that's truly worthwhile comes easy. Sometimes 
things flow more readily. Um, <clears throat> and you've got to bottle that. Um, but you always have to shape, hammer, edit, cut, slash, add. Sometimes one puts something in, sometimes one takes something out. <clears throat> um, one has to reconsider, one has to listen, and so on. You can also flaunt with words from time to time. Mm. But you can't get away with insincerity. Mm. Do you think your poetry is the best mirror of your life and personality? That's where I am. Um, I've revealed the essence of me more in my poems than anywhere else. Love, longing, loss, what we mean by home, homecoming, um, place. place. Um, those are the dominant themes. The things that matter most. Yes. Before we finish, um, is there anything, is there a single w poem you would like to, to read to, to wind up this talk? Is there one work that, that you'd love to <coughs> share? Well, I'll read you a short poem. Um, <coughs> It says something about one of my predominant interests, um, passions, most serious concerns, and that is environmentalism. Our place here, um, continual war against nature, which humans have been conducting for far too long and still do. Sky. If the sky knew half of what we're doing down here, it would be stricken, inconsolable, and we would have nothing but rain. Thank you, Brian. Um, congratulations on the honorary lit, D lit, and good luck for your talk tomorrow. Thank you, Brian.